and welcome to the show. Once again, we have a fabulous lineup of guests to energize and inspire you. It's time to wake up your wow with your host, international award-winning speaker, Kath Vincent. On the show, we hear from natural medicine practitioner, Kerry Douglas Wilkinson, on how to embrace stress. Comedian Brendan Lovegrove tells us why he cleaned up his act. And Diana Thompson shares tips from her book, The Naked Speaker. And in the Wild Records music slot with Jesse Wilde, we hear original music from singer-songwriter John Kent. Here comes the hat song again. All this and more to wake up your wow. Welcome, thanks for being on the show. Thank you, Kath, it's great to be here. So you're a natural medicine practitioner and you focus a lot on mental well-being. And stress affects everyone, doesn't it? I mean, no one's immune from stress. No, not at all. I mean, the people that I see in the clinic, my youngest client that I've worked with is two years old with anxiety. Oh my God, two years old? Two years old, obviously working with the mum. Yeah. Um, and then my oldest client, 71, yeah. they just come across with depression or out of the blue. Wow. So it really does affect anyone and everyone. Yeah. And your message is really about embracing stress. T tell me, how do Absolutely. you embrace stress? <laughs> well, I'm always aiming to build a person up so they're adaptive and resilient to stress. That's my job, that's my aim. And that's so we can be able to learn the lessons from the stress, we can mm. grow from them and evolve from the challenges mm. that life brings. Yeah. Interesting, because I think mostly we think stress is bad, keep it away. We don't think, how can I bring it into my life? How can yeah. I learn from it? Yeah. yeah. And it's about being able to see things from a higher perspective. So being able to see the silver linings in all of life's trials and tribulations, yeah. <laughs> which can be really difficult yeah. at the time. Um, but if we can get into that space, then we can evolve as creatures. Yeah. Um, and that's really fulfilling. Yeah. Tell me about the scope of the work that you do. Mental well-being is a global problem yeah. and specifically in New Zealand we have really high rates of suicide, mood disorders, addictions. Mm. Um, it's around one in five New Zealanders that suffer from a mood disorder. Wow, okay. And you deal with both ends of the spectrum from chronic stress to absolutely. lesser disorders. Yeah, absolutely. How does a person know whether they're suffering chronic stress or, or just having a bad day? It's usually the ongoing symptoms. So when you're having a bad day or you've had a stressful event, typically you will get over that quite quickly. Whereas when you're under chronic stress, you feel the symptoms a lot every day. So it's a consistent yeah. um, feeling that you have. Okay, and typically I think people often lose their way and they feel bad and they stop realising what it's like to feel good. Yeah, that's right. So it's... Getting back to balance, and that's what I do in the natural medicine, is actually restoring or helping restore a person's health so they can actually get back to what they used to be like, their normal balance. Yeah. What can a person do for themselves if they start thinking, you know, I feel stressed every day, I'm getting the kids off to school, I'm doing this, I'm yeah. stressed in my work, whatever it is. What, yeah. what can people do for themselves? On a daily basis, it's really important to look after yourself. So from the things, eating well. So good nutrition, the things that we put in our mouth, the beverages that we have. So not too much coffee, not too much wine. Why are you looking at me that way? <laughs> and don't worry, I enjoy a good glass of Chardonnay. <laughs> However, it is the things that we do on a daily basis that will keep us well and keep us performing. So mm -hmm. the other things, one of the biggest things that I find that I say all the time to clients is to get their sleep patterns right. Right. And that is because we, uh, we have our metabolism and our hormones are ruled by our sleep-wake cycles, the light and the dark. Right. And so what people tend to do is they go to, they, they're on their screens until 9, 10, 11 o'clock at night. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so the natural sleep hormone, our melatonin, can't kick in and doesn't allow us to have a good sleep. Yeah. So people should, what, turn off their de devices at a certain time? What should they do? 
Absolutely. So nine o'clock oh. is the <laughs> golden time. Um, and that's because that's when our natural sleep hormone um, melatonin kicks in. Right. So if we're still on our computer screens or yeah. we're on our phone and we're on social media, yeah. we're stimulating our system when our system is naturally trying right. to wind down and go to sleep. But you don't have to go to sleep at nine o'clock. That's right, just okay. off the screens right. and dim the lights. So even, it's really helpful in your house to actually, if you can, go and dim the lights. Oh. Just so you can actually induce that melatonin okay. um, to assist in your sleep. Okay, and you mentioned eating well. Now obviously if it's something that you're gonna repeat time and again, you should mm. really get that right. How do you know what Absolutely. to eat? It's, it's different for everybody. So when I'm in clinic, I will do a specific um, diet for that individual. Yeah. But it's more so what not to have or to minimise yeah. rather than having a set diet or protocol that you must follow. Okay. So the main things I do with um, dietary advice is things like coffee. Yeah. So not having too much. And the reason being is that if you're already in a depleted state, yeah. then that can really imbalance the system and it can cause you to have an adrenaline spike yeah. and those sorts of things. So it's more minimising what may be affecting the imbalance rather than making sure you eat a certain thing every day. Okay. And what's your view on sugar? That's my other vice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's about you. <laughs> it's, all, it's, all about, it's all about me. Um, for other people, I know that they suffer yeah. with these problems. Yeah, absolutely. So, again, what happens is that things like sugar, they stimulate our stress response system. Yeah. So we don't want to have too much of it. It's the same thing as coffee that's stimulating the system. So when I'm working with somebody and their system's already depleted, if they then have sugary food on top of that, they're just depleting their system even more, yeah. worsening their symptoms. So it's not going to be helpful. And when people start to tackle their stress by you know, working at the source, not just the symptoms, how quickly can they get to see results? When we are working with a person on their deeper issues, we are also working with the symptoms. We're helping improve the symptoms as we're going along. Right. So we can see an improvement sometimes within days yeah. um, because natural medicine can support symptoms as well as address the underlying imbalances. Great. Thanks so much for joining us on the show, Kerry. Thank you very much, Kerry. Up next, Brendan Lovegrove with the changing face of comedy. Brendan Lovegrove, welcome back on the show. Nice to be here. You're looking great. You've got a smart jacket on. Well, yeah, the last time I was on, I had a grey jacket on and my <laughs> mum complained. She said I thought I looked relatively homeless. So you very mysteriously said to me, oh, mm. your life's completely different since the last time we spoke, and I'm really curious. Well, I think, I think the last time we spoke, we were talking about comedy uh, back in... in you know, at that time, I think I think um, I'm, what I would say is now I think I'm enjoying being a comic and being in the environment of stand-up comedy more than more than ever. Serious? Yeah, because it's just like um, it's so much more diverse than it ever was, and, and it's really interesting being having done comedy for say 25, you know, nearly 25 years, yeah. and I would look at the diversity in some of the comics and the ability and the and the talent of the comics and the, you know, a lot of the women that we have, a lot of the people from the trans community, a lot of people, from, you know, from the gay community, who are so fantastic. Now I realise for, you know, 20 years, people were looking at just white dudes <laughs> doing their thing, and now, I, and now I see how, you know, how much it matters, and it's, it's fantastic. And I, I look after a, a, about 10 rooms throughout the country, but two of them are, are raw nights, so for sort of newcomers or, or people on the verge of pro nights. And, um, and so I get to see all, all the, all, you know, all, all the, the young talent, talent. And, and it's just fantastic. And, so um, how did you know that you wanted to be a comedian? Well, I, uh, I, it's funny that you say, but to be honest with you, now, I have to be one because I, I don't have a plan B. And, uh, <laughs> You're not skilled for anything that, else. That's actually kind of the truth. I don't, you know, I, I, it's, I'm, it's too late to start a band. Yeah. And it's, uh, if I was going to act, be an actor, I would have done something like that by now. And, and I'm probably a little bit old for university. I was going to go to university when I was, um, when I was uh, about 19, but I decided I have a gap life. 
And uh, so I just started, so I'll just take this life off and, you know, see what the next is like. A gap life, a gap I life. love it. Now that is a gag, by the way, if you didn't pick that one, that's... that's... But like at school, were you just mm. like really naughty and Yeah, I, well, I was and... definitely naughty, but yeah. I was also very good at getting away with it. So I had sort of the gift of the gab. Yeah. And I think that, um, um, you know, so I'm probably relatively charming as a, as, in oh, my really? youth. <laughs> you um, say? <laughs> well, I was back in the days of caning, you see, so they had that option. Oh. They, they could have whacked me, but I used, to, I used to get out of that. But I think, it, I th there wasn't really a lot of stand-up comedy when I'd begun. It's just when I saw a show one night, um, I was, I, I, my heart bet, and I thought, I want to give this a try, and I'm really pleased I did. How old were you when you did your first gig? I was 23. Yeah. Mm. And were you nervous then, or were you just... Absolutely. I was very nervous a month before, extremely nervous a week before, and beside myself on the day. Right. And so, but there is a thing just before you go on stage where you go, I have no idea how this is going to go, but I'm just going to go through with it. And fortunately, some of the comics who were on before me were on very bad. <sighs> and uh, <laughs> to be honest, I can't remember. But um, I think so, there aren't many around from the first sort of five rookies nights in, in Auckland. Um, I, I think I'm one of the only lasting sort of comics from that time. I started before Mike King and the late Ewan Gilmore, so we're going back a fair way here. But it was just even on stage, I remember giving my first laugh and thinking this, it just felt, I just felt very at home with that. Yeah. And I, I knew I, was, I wanted to do something in the arts and comedy is such a, especially stand-up, is such a um, good way to do comedy because it's you're by yourself and it's not a collective. So the highs obviously can be very high, but you know the lows can obviously be very low. Yeah. So mm. what is it do you think that has you like? It's a 25 year career. Mm. You know, other people have given up along the wayside, but not you. Well, I, I was lucky enough to get the opportunity early to go to England and, and sort of um, and, and learn my trade there. And so I think the, the whole London and, and the English or the UK circuit made me very sharp. So I was, I was it's a, sometimes it's a matter of technique, you know, I was making sure I was being funny constantly. Yeah. For, you know, so gag now, gag now, gag now, because the comics I was working with were like, set up, set up, bang, set up, set up, bang, if that makes any sense, yeah. rather than elongating something and then having a big punchline at the end. Yeah. But, I, but it really taught me to be funny all the time, so I can make sure that now my audiences are constantly... Um, in, entertained as quickly as possible. Yeah, so it's been it's been sharp. Yeah, I it? think so. Yeah. And I've got a bit of a formula about the way that I write, and also I've got rid of a few things that have made me far more watchable for an audience. Oh yeah, such yeah. as. Well, I got rid of. Um, I, see, I'm, I'm still a comic from back of the days when you could pretty much talk about anything. Things that now would genuinely be found um, offensive by certain members of the public. And I think I probably understand more about why they would be upset by certain things I said in the past. Um, I cringe at some of my at some of my old material. Not that because I think it was a necessarily bad gay, but now it's just so untoward or you know so risque. Now yeah. back then it seemed fine, yeah. but that it was upsetting people is um, it sort of upsets me even even many years down the line. So I try and avoid that, and and I've done it pretty much by just making sure I don't talk about certain subjects that might ignite some offence in somebody. Yeah. I just don't want that. Do you have to be funny all the time? Like when you're at home and you're loading the dishwasher and you're doing all no, the things? No, no, because there's no money in it. There's no money in the dishwasher. <laughs> you know, it's this, and, and I'm quite happy not to be funny when I'm, when I'm doing that. So give us an example of some of your new material. Well, um, I've been concentrating a little bit, of course, on Donald Trump. Oh, yeah. Um, because I, and, and I know a lot of people don't like him, but I, as a comic, I like him because I get writer's block. And, uh, and I find it very easy to get over my writer's block whenever I, you know, I sort of watch him. But I had to laugh the other day because he signed a peace agreement with Kim Jong-un and uh, my daughter came into the... Uh, to my room and went, Dad, I'm really happy that he signed that peace agreement because, you know, I'm really young and there was a chance of nuclear war. But I think as an older person, we're just really happy that he signed that peace agreement with Kim Jong-un because, you know, I, I just don't think we want to sit through a whole new series of MASH. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's like, I, and, and I, I've done that gag a few times and I quite like it because MASH was the Korean War, obviously. But um, an American guy came up to me and said, were you the comic that talked about the MASH joke, and I went, yeah, and he went, do you know that MASH was on TV for 20 years, but the Korean War was only on for four years? What does that tell you? And I had to say, well, what that tells me is that the, that the Korean War wasn't on at 7.30 for half an hour every Thursday. <laughs> um, and if it was, it would, you know, it would still be going. But, um, and, but that's one example. So, I can, so Trump's can sort of, something like that is, can really ignite your passion or something. And also the other day, I can just get little things off the top of my head because someone came up to me the other night at the Classic, the comedy store, and said, and he saw me smoking and he went, you shouldn't smoke. Every time you have a cigarette, it takes a week off your life. And I said, well, that can't be true because if it was, I would have died when I was two. And that would have been weird because someone would have gone, how did he die? 
and someone would have had to have gone, oh, he was a big smoker in his 40s, <laughs> right? So, and I'm quite proud of that joke. I think it's wonderful. And, I, and, it, makes, and it makes me angry that I'm, you know, not a bigger star. But... Um, <laughs> Are you still smoking? Uh, at, well, only because of the gag. Oh, OK, yeah, good. Yeah, there's no point in not smoking and yeah. then doing that gag. I don't morally feel good. Yeah. And I'm not a quitter. When I start something, <laughs> I see it through to the end. You know? Well, thanks for not quitting. Thanks for not quitting comedy. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. It's been nice to be back. Thank you for thanks, having me. Thanks, Brendan. Up next, Diana Thompson with confidence tips for public speaking. Diana, welcome. Thanks for being on the show with us. Thanks for having me. Now, you are a professional speaker and you train other people to be confident when they speak. Correct. So a lot of people would be nervous when they speak. It's a very common fear, right? It is a very common fear. Yes, some people like to say it's their number one fear. Wow, more than death, right? <laughs> there is that joke out there that people would rather be in the coffin than giving the eulogy at a funeral. But yeah. what? I think we all know that's not true. <laughs> Why do you think it's such a common fear? I think it's becoming more common now because, firstly, people have started to listen to this concept that it's got to be your number one fear. So it's like, oh yeah, it's their fear, yeah. so I've got to fear it, it's scary. Yeah. And then people are starting to lose touch with just that formal speaking opportunities that they used to maybe have every day in a meeting or every week in a weekly meeting. Yeah, I guess the rise of technology, you know, we can message people, email people, all that kind of stuff. People are speaking less. I think so. And, you know, people are uh, avoiding even phone calls these days <laughs> where we grow up having to use the phone. Um, other people these days are sort of, oh, no, I don't actually call anybody. Yeah, when I was growing up, we weren't allowed to use the phone because it was so expensive. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. <laughs> Show my age now. <laughs> so, Diana, your book has just come out. Congratulations. Thank you. <sighs> new, new print smell. Don't you love that? It's very exciting. So, hey, tell me about the book, The Naked Speaker. Well, the title, first of all, is a, a play a little bit on that naked chef concept that was such a refreshing change for, for the cookbook industry. But it's really about the fact that when we stand up and speak, we feel nervous and yeah. naked. Yeah. And there's that silly thing about, oh, just imagine them all naked. <laughs> no, worst <laughs> advice. Because you're the one that feels exposed and naked. And then... That's how a lot of people will relate to that. Yeah. It's also called the public speaking cookbook because I've figured out there's weird similarities between creating and delivering a speech as there is with cooking. And so I kind of just pull, pull on that, those analogies to help people go, oh, yeah, I get that. Yeah, okay. I, can, I can cook up a, a speech or a presentation. So I love this one, recipes for speaking nerves. What's your advice for people when they start speaking? That's often where the nervousness takes hold, isn't it? It is. The nervousness often comes about when they're going outside their comfort zone or they're speaking to a larger group, and in particular if they're standing up. So a lot of it is about preparing and understanding the nerves yeah. and then doing practice and rehearsal, but also just... Uh, understanding that the nerves probably will never really go away and that's okay. You can actually use some of that energy to uh, bring some life and some spontaneity to what you're going to say. Oh, right. So what you're saying is the nervousness is actually your friend in some ways. Yeah, it might, that might be a hard <laughs> sell, but certainly there are ways that you can reduce your nerves so that you can get through whatever presentational speech you've got without actually losing sleep, sweating buckets, yeah. and running off to the toilet every five minutes. Brilliant. Well, that sounds very useful for everyone. So tell me a bit about your own experience of speaking. I started public speaking training when I was actually living in Singapore and really needed to build up my self-confidence. Now, that sounds very strange. Why would you think that you could get self-confidence from public speaking, but it really worked well for me and I started to really st enjoy the public speaking side of it and end up building my self-confidence that I ended up getting a job in a foreign country, which was fantastic again. Right. Um, I moved through what was called the Toastmasters system there and when I moved back to New Zealand, I actually really felt a really deep desire to help other people find that self-confidence and get better at public speaking. So I started my business yeah. and a couple of years later I'm writing a book to help people. Wow. Now, you, you mentioned that confidence is not just in public speaking but it can help you in all sorts of areas of your life. That's right. 
The public speaking is a tool that you can use to build your self-confidence and then apply it within your work life, your community, even just uh, pucking up the courage to tell your partner something that you probably wouldn't have previously. Yeah. Now, there are lots of books out there on public speaking. Why is this one different? I noticed that there wasn't a book for people that are speaking just, say, in their work environment. You know, can you please do a presentation to the executive team? Ah! Uh, or there might be uh, an opportunity where you could speak at a conference. It's not really a keynote, it's not a TED talk. You just need to get through and find out quickly how to do that. Yeah. And so this can be used for your home life and work life and almost every day, in fact, to build your self-confidence every day. Now tell us, where can we get the book? I've got my copy, but where can everyone else get theirs? The copy you can either get electronically, so you can get it through Amazon and have it on your Kindle. Yep. Uh, and you can order it through bookshops. Uh, they can order it in for you or off the nakedspeaker.co.nz website. Fabulous. Well, thank you so much for joining us here today. Thank you. Wild, welcome back. Great to be back. Season four, can you believe it? No, I can't. How did we get here? I know. Hey, have you lost weight? You look incredible. Oh, just a little bit, you know, like maybe 30 kilos or so. Are yeah. you serious? Yeah. 30 kilos. How did yeah. you do it? Well, as you know, uh, we were building this incredible recording studio last season and I was still working on the apartment and stuff upstairs. And we didn't have a kitchen for ages, and I, and I put on more. I was drinking beer and eating pizza and having yeah. fun, yeah. but also it was just really stressful building this this incredible place that we've got here. And um, I just woke up one morning and decided, you know, I'd had enough and I wanted to lose some weight. And I did a little bit of research, found a place called Cohen's Lifestyle Clinic. Cohen's Lifestyle Clinic. Yep. And um, amazing. Eleven weeks later. Eleven. Just, you lost thirty kilos. Yeah, it was about thirty point five. Yeah. Thirty point five kilos in eleven weeks. Yep. Oh my god. And, and like, uh, and you were healthy and well. Like, because that sounds really rapid. Yep. The first three or four days are a bit rough because it's like you're detoxing, and yeah. then after that, it's just you feel amazing. You feel yeah. great and uh, wow. clean. And and I've, it's been a year, so I've actually kept it off for a year. So. Well, that, you look amazing, and cool. Thank it's you. great to see you looking so good. So listen, who is recording in the studio today? Well, we've got a guy named Johnny Kemp, and he's got a cahoon player with him, which is going to be awesome. And um, I first met uh, Johnny in Hollywood, on Hollywood Boulevard, and uh, he had a spare ticket for Tommy Emmanuel concert. We went in there um, at the Knitting Factory on Ho Hollywood Boulevard, and um, Chet O'Connell got to get up and play with oh, Tommy Emmanuel, and we've he's had been on the show. twice yeah. now. And, and then we all went out to dinner at the Roosevelt Hotel um, with Tommy Emmanuel, Chet O'Connell, and Johnny Kemp. Cool. Well, let's hear from John. Let's do it. Behind the night, we will hide away together. The circle of time joins us forever. Under the light By the jukebox in the corner Everything's in order As it should be Here comes that song again The girl just could be right It's beyond you and me It's not what you see Behind the night Through all the tears The waiting goes to show The more I think I know The less I know Down your beer Let's get out of here We can make Sedona By dawn tomorrow dream again the same one every time it's beyond you and me it's not what you see behind the night
night We cling to our own heaven What we choose to see And what we never Slow it down Stay with me a moment Help me get out from under the weather Here comes the hat song again The same one every time Here comes the hat dream again The girl just could be right it's beyond you and me It's not what you see Behind the night Here comes that song again Here comes that song again Here comes that song again the night John, that was fabulous thank you so much for being here thank you for having me thank you cool hey I, the first time i ever saw you play was at the when you're doing the buddy holly show what was that all about i actually you know i just i had an original band actually it was pretty theatrical and it broke up so I, I decided to go to bed for about a month because I was really depressed. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't get out of bed, I was really bummed out. And then the phone rang and um, somebody said, we've heard about you, you're kind of a theatrical bloke. Do you want to do, have a go at cricket coming along and auditioning for Buddy Holly, you know? Which was sort of off the books, I didn't have an agent or anything like that. And I just had that weird feeling like, that's mine. Cool. I'm just going to get that, I'm going to go for that. You know, I just had a weird feeling, but the, funny enough, the audition I did was horrid, you know? Had a really raspy voice and had like done like a 28 set gig at some pub, you know, the night before. Well, the show I saw, the <laughs> night I saw, you were amazing, oh, and you. it was just such a good, you know, you were a perfect buddy, Holly. Thank you. I kind of got obsessed with it, and in fact, it was funny too because my dad had always said get a real job, but at that point, he sort of endorsed me being an entertainer. In fact, he, I think he came to pretty much every gig I did at the St James. He was obsessed with it. It was weird. And you're making a documentary now. Uh, yeah, we're making a documentary called Aliens, Drugs, and Music, which um, we started filming in. Um, Los Angeles in 2016. I'd lived in America since the beginning of the millennium. I was recording out there and I had a filmmaker, uh, Scott Flyger, for G South Films, uh, followed me over to make a record, uh, you know, to follow to, you know, sort of uh, catch me making the record and he kept, we caught a whole lot of other things as well. It was kind of a crazy time and it, so he's followed me through that sort of window of leaving America and coming back to New Zealand and so we're still going. But hopefully we'll be done. And that's so. the same record we've been doing some stuff here. That's right. We've been we've been we've picked up the slap from the American sessions, um, which were at Danny Hutton's house, um, which is Alice Cooper's old house. We're wow. in the basement. We've picked up the sessions and we've been doing them. We you know we did some other stuff uh, when I felt like doing it because at first I didn't, when I first got back I didn't really feel like touching the project, but we got going and we came into Studio Thirty Eight and we've done some work here too. And was, you know you know what it's like nowadays. It's it's. For, in some strange way, it seems even harder to get stuff done on musically than it ever was, and even though we've got all the technology. But we're working away at it. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Thanks so much. I really enjoy myself. Thanks, Thank you. Sean. OK. Thank you. My thanks to all my special guests, to Kerry, to Brendan, to Diana, to John and Daniel, and, of course, our very own Jesse Wilde. And until next time, don't wait to wake up your wow. Down, down, yep. Okay. Then front hand on the top, yep. Have the top one hard, yep, yep. Oh, I like that. I like it. This is like the new one. What do you think? Oh, yeah, John's coming in now. Here we go. Let's jump. <laughs> the more you sway, yeah. That's not the worst. The worst it gets. <laughs> 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 <laughs>